Good evening, everyone. Welcome back this evening. And um, we're continuing our journey. And I don't want you to stand up, but I'll stand up, right? The, um, we're reading the Gospel according to Luke uh, today. And uh, any of the Gospels, we can read them at a surface level, or we can go a little bit deeper and then go very, very deeply into it. So reading the Gospel today, in a summary, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, and he gives them plenty of food. But uh, first of all, in this Gospel, there's no mention of the boy. The boy is only mentioned in John's account. But what's very striking about today's account from Luke is the word 12. 12 is a very significant word, very significant number for the Jewish people. Like we know there were 12 apostles. Okay, why were there 12 apostles? Because there were 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, and at the end of the miracle, there are 12 wicker baskets filled with food left over to feed the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the symbolism of it. That uh, Jesus had this vision of a banquet that would bring all the tribes of Israel, the 12 of them, together at a banquet on the side of the mountain, and they would eat to their fill. That's a very important thing in today's gospel, the number 12. Another number that's very important for the Hebrew people is the number seven. Seven is regarded as the complete number. So we have five loaves, but how many fish? Two. Five and two, seven. The complete symbolic number for the Jewish people. Just when I'd finished, or thought I'd finished preparing this uh, reflection, I got another book on the Eucharist. And have you ever seen a movie, and the start of the movie is actually the end of the movie? Have you ever seen that type of movie? It starts with the end, and then it goes back a few years and leads on then to the conclusion. Well, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to give you the conclusion. Okay from this book. It's called The Mystery, Eucharist Mystery of Presence, Sacrifice, and Communion. It is one of the deepest books I've read on the Eucharist, so be patient with yourself. But he says, when food and drink are taken into our bodies, they are converted into the very substance of our bodies to strengthen and conserve our bodies. We'll agree with that. Food, we take it in, and then it becomes part of our bodies. Thus, the union, the intimate union, is created between food and ourselves. It becomes one with us. This union is another aspect of the sacramental sign of the Eucharist. For the Eucharist is a sacrament of communion. And that's why we say Holy Communion with God. The Eucharist is a sacrament of communion. It creates an intimate union between us and Christ, whom we receive. However, Christ does not become transformed into us, as our food is. Christ does not become transformed into us, as our food is. Rather, the Eucharist transforms us spiritually into the image of Christ. Rather, the Eucharist transforms us spiritually into the image of Christ. Let us stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. And I not only welcome you here to our celebration, but I welcome people from all over the states. I know there are people joining us from Georgia and as far west as Montana. So we, we invite everyone to join us. And a thing comes up with the Eucharist. Who is worthy to receive the Eucharist? Well, my answer is very simple. None of us are. Let's get us straight. None of us are worthy 
to receive the body and blood of Christ. But I don't want to, us to confess those times because we're not worthy, but what about the times we received the Eucharist in a disrespectful way, in a less than reverent way? Let us call to mind those times that we receive God into us, but not in a very religious, holy, respectful manner. I confess to Almighty God and you, my brothers and sisters, that I've greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I've done and in what I've failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you. O God, who show the light of your truth to those who go astray, so that they may return to the right path, give all who for the faith they profess are accounted Christians the grace to reject whatever is contrary to the name of Christ and to strive after all that does it honour. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. For as often as you eat and drink, you proclaim the death of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The word of the Lord. The Responsorial Psalm. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. How shall I make a return to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? The cup of salvation I will take up, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid you have loosed my bonds. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. To you will I offer sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will pay in the presence of all his people. Our blessing is a communion with the blood of Christ. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, says the Lord. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus spoke to the crowds about the kingdom of God and he healed those who needed to be cured. As the day was drawing to a close, the twelve approached him and said, dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the surrounding villages and farms and find lodging and provisions, for we are in a deserted place. Jesus said to them, give them some food yourselves. They replied, five loaves and two fish are all we have, unless we ourselves go and buy food for all these people. Now the men there numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50. They did so and made them all sit down. Then taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing over them, broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the crowd. They all ate and were satisfied. And when the leftover fragments were picked up, they filled 12 wicker baskets. The Gospel of the Lord. When we eat material food, it becomes us. When we eat spiritual food, we become it. When we eat spiritual food, we become it. And an expression that has upset me for a long time, and you're one you're familiar with, another one from the gospel, to the person who has, more will be given. You're familiar with that line. To the person who has, more will be given. A young boy, 2,000 years ago, came to Jesus with his humble gifts of cheap barley bread and fish. Jesus took the gifts. He looked up to heaven, blessed them, and gave thanks. He broke the bread and divided the fish. He then distributed the food through his disciples. In all the synoptic gospels, the only occasion outside the feeding miracles when Jesus acted as a host to a meal is the Last Supper. Jesus was at a wedding at Cana. He often was recounted having a meal, but the only time that he actually hosted a meal outside the Last Supper was the miracle of the loaves and fishes. So in other words, the only time other than the miracle of the loaves and fishes, when Jesus took bread, gives thanks, pronounces a blessing, breaks the bread, and gives it to his followers is the Last Supper or the first Eucharist. And that is very, very significant. During each Eucharistic meal, we too bring our humble gifts of bread and wine. God accepts these gifts, he blesses them, and then he transforms them into the body and blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Each time we celebrate our Mass, our Eucharist, we recall, and we should recall, what was given up or sacrificed for a better cause for others, for us. The boy sacrificed his food for others. God sacrificed his son for the world the day his son was born. Jesus Christ sacrificed his body and blood for us the day he died on the cross. Today we look at Luke's version of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. 
The crowds followed Jesus when they learned that he had withdrawn to Bethsaida, but moved with compassion. If I was asked to sum up Jesus Christ in one word, it would be compassion. Not rules and regulations, just one word. Jesus was compassionate. So moved with compassion, Jesus taught them. He also cured the sick. But as evening approached, the twelve, again it is the twelve just mentioned, became concerned about the large crowd and how they would eat. They approached Jesus, and what did they say? Dismiss the crowds. Send them away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and farms and find lodging and provisions, for we are in a deserted place. That was ironic because the 12 apostles, symbolic of the gathering of the 12 tribes of Israel, here act in a contradiction to their deepest identity, for they want to scatter the people which Jesus wanted to draw to himself. They literally wanted to scatter them. So Jesus challenges them he says, give them some food yourselves. But they protest, five loaves and two fish are all we have, unless we too go and buy food for these people. But it's noticeable, almost oblivious to their complaint, Jesus just simply instructs them to gather the crowds into groups of 50 or so. And then taking the loaves and the fish, Jesus said a blessing over them, broke them, and then he gave them to the disciples for distribution. And this time they did as Jesus asked. And this is worth noting. Initially, the 12 apostles only saw a problem. Jesus now makes them part of the solution. He brings them into the center of this most important miracle, I think so as they can see it up front with their own eyes. The disciples. At the outset of the story, the disciples refused to serve the crowd, preferring to send them away. At the climax of the story, the disciples become themselves the un instrument of the nourishment, setting the loaves and fishes before the people. Bishop Robert Barnes says, within the loop of grace, they discovered their mission and they themselves were enhanced and transfigured. He said, within the loop of grace. Are any of you familiar with that expression, the loop of grace? Well, I wasn't either until I read the book called Eucharist by Bishop Robert Barron. So he explains it. There is no better example in scripture of the loop of grace than God offers as a sheer grace a gift to us. But if we try to cling to that gift and make it our own, we lose it. If we try to cling to the gifts that God gave us and make them our own, in fact, we actually lose them. The loop of grace is to use what God has given. And we find the same lesson throughout the Gospels. Use what you're given or lose it. Mark 25, the story of the three men who were given talents. Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man going on a journey called his servants and he entrusted his possessions. He entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to a third he gave one talent, to each according to his ability. On his return, then the one who had received one talent came forward and he said, out of fear I went off and I buried your talent. Out of fear I went off and I buried your talent, here it is back. 
Now then, take that talent from him. Take that talent from him and give it to the man with five. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Even what he has will be taken away. The person who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. But the person who has not will lose even what he has. At first sight, this seems a shocking, unfair, unchristian thing to do. At least to me, I was shocked by it. How unchristian, how unfair. However, an interesting example, explanation from this parable, parable is, if we have a talent, we should use it. If we have a talent, we should definitely use it. Because in doing so, we will develop that very talent. But if we fail to use that gift, that talent, with time, we will eventually lose it. How would the miracle story of the loaves and fishes have ended had the young boy hidden his food under his cloak? Had he hidden it, how would it have ended the parable, the miracle? There would have been no miracle. I assume many of you, like myself, had to learn a second language in high school. Most of you had, okay? How many of you can speak that language today? You can speak it? There's one girl. I had to learn four languages, Irish, English, Latin, and French, French and they're gone, especially French and Latin. Because I didn't use it. If you don't use it, you lose it. On the missions in Central Africa, there were five different languages in the parish I was assigned to, but I was told just to learn one. And I did go to a, a language school for six weeks, and I learned the basic grammar of the language. But even after six weeks, I could not put a sentence together. I was making no progress. So I was sent to a very rural parish to try and just learn the language. And that was a very important discovery. It was to build on what I already had, even if it wasn't much. To build on what I already had, even if it wasn't much. And believe me, I wanted to give up. I wanted to bury the little of that language I had and walk away. But thankfully, with patience, the language began to come to me, began to be part of me. And I find the same in the sacred scriptures. The more I read the sacred scriptures, the more it opens up to me. The more it opens up to me, the more I see connections between the past and the future, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And here we have to face a very important truth. In life, in any life, area of life, marriage, work, priesthood, study, we are never standing still. We're never standing still. If we're not going forward, we're falling backward. If we're not moving forward, we're moving backward. We must see to it then that every day we are advancing toward our goal, and this involves practice and discipline, as we mentioned on Monday. Practice and discipline. On our Christian journey, if we're not moving toward our God, the chances are we are moving away from our God. To the person who has, more will be given. And this is so true of our Christian faith. And maybe that's why we talk about practicing our faith. We talk about practicing our faith because we build on what we already, already, already have. It's almost, for me, 
like putting on badly needed new glasses. I begin to see more and more of what was already there, but hidden. And the more I see, the more I want to see, and the more I want to learn. The hungry people. The hungry people who gathered around Jesus in this scene, I think to represent many of us. The hungry human race, starving in many ways for what will satisfy us. And I think most of us have tried to fill up this emptiness with various pleasures, wealth, power, money. But I think none of these work precisely because we are actually wired for God. We are made in the image of God. We have the DNA of God. So we are wired to God. I came across a book just recently by a girl called Zoe Change, and it's called The Influence of Your Superpower. And this is a secular book, not a spiritual book, but I found this expression, this sentence, I have watched professional people get what they want and only then discover that it wasn't what their hearts truly longed for. I've seen professional people get what they want and only then discover that it wasn't really what their hearts longed for. Take young children on Christmas morning when they open their long sought gifts. At least in Ireland, some of them play with the boxes, not with the toys. As St. Augustine finally discovered, and as many of us have discovered, our hearts are restless until they do rest in God. A question often asked, why did God, who was perfect in every way, and who stands in need of nothing outside of himself, go to the trouble of creating us? The answer is found, provided by the First Vatican Council. God created the heavens and the earth, not out of need, but in order to manifest his goodness. That's why God created the earth, to manifest his goodness. The theologian, Dionysius, said that good by its nature is diffusive. Good by its nature is giving of itself. And God is good. God is completely giving of himself. Giving of himself. Have you ever noticed a person who is in good form, good mood? He is the heart of a party. He is bubbling with life. He can't keep it to himself. God, by his nature, is giving. Giving of himself to the point of giving his only begotten Son. Jesus Christ is giving of himself to the point of giving us his body and blood. At the last soup, supper, Jesus said, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body. And take this, all of you, and eat of it, and drink of it, for this is the cup of my blood. The central teaching in this, the central image in this teaching is eating and drinking. Eating and drinking are acts of integration, acts by which part of the world becomes part of us. And as a result, when the part of the world outside becomes part of us, we put on weight. When we eat too much, we put on weight. And back at home, if you describe a person as having a beer belly, well, you know where the belly came from. It came from too much beer. We are not separated from the world. In fact, we're physically formed by the world we live in. It is an act, it is the act of eating that Jesus uses for our spiritual purposes. As we eat bread, it becomes part of us. Likewise, we must incorporate the bread of life, the presence of Jesus, and make it our own. The key concern is a transfer 
of the presence from Jesus to us. As a spiritual teacher puts it, when we eat material food, it becomes us. But when we eat spiritual food, we become it. A prayer in the Roman Missal after Holy Communion captures this for me, and I pray it here quite often. What has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart. For what has been given to us in time, may it be a healing for eternity. The closing prayer after communion on week 27 of ordinary time, let us pray, grant us, almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume. So as to be transformed into what we consume. Receiving the Eucharist is called Holy Communion. And a few years ago, I was at a wedding back in Ireland, and it was very, very well prepared. But what truly shocked me was after Holy Communion, the whispering in the pews drowned it out the reflective music. The whispering grew and grew until it became noise. And that shocked me. When I was growing up, and maybe yourselves, one of the practices instilled in us children by our parents was private prayer after receiving Holy Communion. People returned to their places after receiving the body of Christ and they usually knelt down and then they put their head into their hands and focused on the presence of God that just had entered into their bodies. It was a most meaningful part of Mass. It was guaranteed union or communion with Christ, the Son of God. Have some of us lost that sacred moment? Holy Communion is a holy sacrament, becoming by grace what God is by nature. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Sacraments are designed to place the spiritual life within the human being. Sacraments are designed to place the spiritual life of God within the human being. Thus, just as food and drink are required for the sustenance of biological life, our Eucharist is essential for the sustenance of our spiritual life. The following story, and some of you are familiar with it, may help to summarize this reflection. Some time ago, a little boy named Johnny was told by his doctor that he could save the life of his young sister if he could give her some of his blood. The six-year-old girl was near death the victim of a disease from which her brother Johnny himself had made a full recovery two years earlier. His sister's only chance of recovery was a blood transfusion from someone who had previously conquered the illness. Since the two children were the exact same rare blood type, Johnny was the ideal donor. Johnny, would you like to give some of your blood for Mary? The doctor asked. The boy hesitated. His lower lip started a tremble, and then he smiled and said, Sure, Doc, I will give my blood for my sister. Soon the two children were wheeled into the operating room. Mary, pale and thin, Johnny robust, the picture of health. Neither spoke, but when their eyes met, Johnny just smiled. As his blood siphoned into Mary's veins, one could almost see new life coming into her once tired body. 
The ordeal was almost over when Johnny's brave little voice broke the silence. Doctor, when do I die? Doctor, when do I die? It was only then that the doctor realized what the moment of hesitation, the trembling lip, had meant earlier. Johnny actually thought that he was giving, by giving his blood to his sister, he was also giving up his life. He thought he was meant to die. But in that brief moment, he had made his decision. He was going to do it. Like a nameless young boy, 2,000 years ago, Johnny was prepared to give up, to use what God had given him to help his sister. Jesus did, in fact, give up his life for us. Jesus did, in fact, give up his life for us. When we receive Holy Communion, his body and blood are actual spiritual transfusions for each of us. His body and blood are spiritual transfusions for you and for me. When we eat food, it becomes us. But when we eat spiritual food, we become more spiritual. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through you, goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, our Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Thank you. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Look upon the offerings of your church, O Lord, as she makes her prayer to you, and grant that when consumed by those who believe, they may bring ever greater holiness through Christ our Lord, Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he is the true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of an everlasting sacrifice and was the first to offer himself as the living victim, commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. As we eat his flesh that was sacrificed for us we are made strong. As we drink his blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so are the angels and the archangels, with the thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so as they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, 
for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Daniel our Bishop, the clergy and all your people. Father, we ask you to hear the prayers in our hearts, the prayers in our petition basket in front of our altar. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who've died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you to your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of that peace. Oh, thank you very much. Peace. Thank you. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. 
Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ keep us safe for eternal life.
Let us pray. Thank you. What has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. Let us pray. Grant us, Almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Before the final blessing, the, um, maybe be seated for a second. Be seated for a second. Um, Normally, I, I give out an evaluation sheet on the last night, but because there's so many questions you can answer even now, you know, there's only two questions you can't answer, number one and two, which is uh, which was the most helpful and which was the least helpful talk. But I'm asking you this year for um, your comments on the format of the mission, that we have the reflection as the homily, other places, there's just a talk, there's no, no Eucharist. But if you like the format, the reflection within the Mass. And also, this is a dangerous question to ask, the length of the reflection, is the reflection too long? Or is it too short? Or is it fine, right? And also, um, do you find the music helpful in creating a prayerful atmosphere? All of those questions you could answer if you wish tonight, but not question one and two. But I really would appreciate if you would give us some thought because your opinions are so vital to my preparation for future parish missions. Tomorrow is our last day. I want to thank you for your donations so far, by the way, in case I forget. I really appreciate your support. and. Uh, we conclude with um, the, the, the statement, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. And some of the disciples said, Jesus, that is a hard saying for us to accept. It's intolerable. And they walked away. It was the only time anybody deserted Jesus because of what he taught, what he preached. So that's what we're looking at tomorrow. Why did those people walk away? Why do we stay? Thank you very much for being here. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Mass is ended. Let us go and announce the gospel by the way we live our lives. Thanks. Have a very good evening. Oh, and, and Tara.